So I think you are interested in writing HTTP services in Go, am I right? If I am, this can be a great video for you. So I'm stumbling upon Reddit and I see this great post with a 389 of votes. That's, that's a lot for Reddit. How to write HTTP services in Go after 13 years. From Matt Ryers, author of Go Programming Blueprints and host of Go Time Podcast. Also, director of engineering at Grafana Labs on the machine learning team. If those are not good credentials, I don't know what is, but if you are interested in knowing who Matt Ryers is, here he is. This is his Twitter. He has a lot of great things, really funny individual. So definitely go check him out. But and the funny thing is he actually has a predecessor post where he says, how I write HTTP services in Go after seven years. And he came back to write another banger of an article. This post covers a range of topics related to building servers in Go, including structuring servers and handlers for maximum maintainability, tips and tricks for optimizing for a quick startup and graceful shutdown, how to handle common work that applies to many types of requests, going deep on properly testing your services, from small projects to large, these practices have stood the test of time for me, and I hope they will for you too. Full blog post is click it. We go right in here. Posted February 9th, so it was a little bit, you know, we're a little, little late, but you can see here, nearly six years ago, I wrote a blog post outlining how I write HTTP service in Go, and I'm here to tell you once again how I write HTTP services in Go. If you guys like Go and this kind of content, make sure you click subscribe button. It does help the channel a lot. A lot of effort goes into these videos, and it truly is the best way to support if you enjoy. But let's get back to the video. And if you're curious why this is such a hot topic or why people are curious about this, well, if you write how to write HTTP servers in Go, you'll get a lot of different links from DigitalOcean, Hacker News. I mean, this is the exact same article we're talking about here. Matt Ryer from five years ago. So you can see here that it really, besides what Matt wrote, I guess now and recently, oh, plug right there. You can see that there isn't too much direction on how to establish and write HTTP servers in Go. So it's really good when you have something like Matt Ryer, but this is a really good uh, breath of fresh air. You can even see there's some examples from the official Go website writing web applications where to kind of walk you through how you can set up an HTTP server and run different things in it. But without further ado, let's actually go into Matt's post here. Who is this post for? This post is for you. It's for everybody who plans to write some kind of HTTP service in Go. You may also find this useful if you're learning Go as lots of examples follow good practices. Experienced gophers might also pick up some nice patterns are awesome. I'm excited. Can hit uh, two fields. So personally, this is a very long article. I do definitely recommend you to go check it out. Link will be in the description below, but there are some parts that I wanted to highlight that resonated with me specifically. And the first one is long argument lists. There must be a limit at which point it stops being the right thing to do. But most of the time, I'm happy adding lists of dependencies as arguments. And while they do sometimes get quite long, I find it still worth it. Yes, it saves me from making a struct, but the real benefit is that I get slightly more type safety from arguments. I can make a struct skipping any fields I don't like, but a function forces my hand. I have to look up fields to know how to set them in a struct, whereas I can't call a function if I don't pass the right argument. It's not so bad if you form it as a vertical list like I've seen in modern front end code. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. I think personally, I've adopted to just using a struct to handle like these argument lists or essentially in this way, calling a method on a type, that type being a struct that I instantiate. And while I do see his point here, I really don't think there's a strong argument both ways. Uh, I think with a struct, yeah, you will just have to, you know, have it be constructed in your kind of constructor, pass on those uh, parameters when you are returning your struct and then use those in your method when you call it, or you could just pass those individual arguments in the actual function call. I think it just runs to preference, but it's interesting to see that there really isn't a decisive method for this. But something that I definitely do agree is map the entire API service in routes.go. This file is the only place in your service where all routes are listed. Point none, and I definitely agree with Matt here. Sometimes you can't help but have things spread around a bit, but it's very helpful to be able to go to one file in every project to see its API surface. So with Go in particular, I think this is something that you can achieve fairly straightforward. I think with the way packages and directories and files are written in Go, it does allow you to avoid having things spread around a bit. I personally don't like that at all. I hate when I'm introduced to a big code base or a change and have to jump through multiple files, multiple different uh, packages to find out, you know, the source of truth for what is written. Uh, I like everything just to be concentrated, modulized into one package declaration. Everything I need can be exported or imported from different packages. So I really enjoy, especially with routes.go, when you have a route definition, you should just be able to go and find it. I mean, look, this is an example of routes.go. He has a function called add routes, and it has all these different handler definitions that he's setting with different routes, API slash v1, handle tenants, get logger tenants, etc, etc. So you can see here in this routes.go, we have this function called setup routes, and it returns our 
chi.mux. And if you just kind of jump into this, uh, this is just a mux struct. Pretty straightforward and standard, any kind of uh, Go backend HTTP framework or whatever. You can see here, this entire file, all it does is just where we define our route. So we have after all the posts, get methods, we have the functions that are passing in, and it's all just declared in this one file. And then we are returning essentially this return R, this, this mux that has all of the maps, uh, all of the paths and handlers mapped to it. And then we feed that into our server downstream. And that's kind of the best way I found to hold a bunch of different rounds. Like you can see here, there's quite a few here. Um, to me, using this with something like Chi has just been the best way for me to approach managing all these kinds of handlers that I have. Here's an interesting one. Funk main only returns run. The run function is like the main function, except that it takes in operating system fundamentals as arguments and returns, you guessed it, an error. So yeah, in this example, Funk is just the pure form of the entry point to the function or to the application, I should say. And run in this case is really what is doing the heavy lifting of running the app. So essentially main acts as like this wrapper or just this entry point to the run function. I wish func main was func main error or like in C where you can return the exit code func main in. By having an ultra simple main function, you too can have your dreams come true. The code above calls straight into run, which creates a context which is canceled by control C or equivalent. If run returns nil, the function exits normally. If it returns an error, we write it to the standard error and exit with a non-zero code. If I'm running command line tool where exit codes matter, I will return an int as well so I could write tests to assert the correct one was returned. If you keep away from any global scope data, you can usually use t.parallel, so in this case of testing, in more places to speed up your test suites. Everything is self-contained, so multiple calls to run don't interfere with each other. I often end up with run function signatures that look like this, so context args, which is a slice of strings, get env, standard in, and the standard out operators here. And now that we've inside the run function, we can go back to running normal Go code where we can return errors like nobody's business. Shout out if error does not equal to nil. We go for just love returning errors. And the sooner we admit that to ourselves, the sooner those people on the internet can win and go away. So I'm not too certain about this pattern. I mean, it makes sense to understand what Matt wrote here. And I actually kind of enjoy the fact that he has this very bare bones, simple main function, which just essentially calls a function and the, whatever it is calling is truly the, I guess, meat and potato or the logic for your app. Typically, my main functions are fairly simple. I mean, it's not like they're massively having a bunch of things that they're calling, uh, but I typically have my main function instantiate all my clients, you know, connect to any DBs or anything like that and really pass all that logic down to running my server or anything like that. So it's interesting to kind of abstract that upstream into a run function and then we can hand handle the error return of that run function. Uh, but it's definitely worth exploring and maybe thinking of a different approach on how I write my Go application uh, adopting this here. So another really cool one is the handle decoding slash encoding in one place section. Every service will need to decode the request bodies and encode response bodies. This is a sensible abstraction that tests the stands of time. Uh, so obviously, if you have written any sort of HTTP server in Go, you know you're probably going to use a JSON on Marshall to really marshal the request body into a struct that you have that has the appropriate JSON tags. And then when you respond back to your client, you also wrap that and, and marshal it. So this pattern, I've almost adopted it to almost be like the if error does not equal to nil pattern, where it's just, you know, I'm gonna have to repeat it over and over and over again. Uh, but what he has set up here is super interesting that I can't wait to show you. I usually have a pair of helper functions called encode and decode. An example version using generics shows you that we really are just wrapping a few basic lines, which I wouldn't usually do. However, this becomes useful when you need to make changes here for all of your APIs. All right, so function encode, it takes a generic, I guess any type, and it's accepting the classic or response writer and request. And here you can see we are setting the header, header and we are creating a new header. We're encoding this V, which is the argument uh, of T. So the interface over here. And if this does not equal to nil, we're good. Otherwise, let's just return nil. But we have successfully encoded this response payload and we have a decode payload here. Again, same uh, generic any. You can see here we will return is of that interface or of those types. And you can see here if error is a JSON dot new decoder and we're decoding into this struct or, in, or into this interface, and then we return this, uh, which is super cool. And one more thing that I found interesting that I've been doing, and I just want to echo that, is the adapter pattern for middleware. So middleware functions take an HTTP handler and return a new one that can run code before and slash or after calling the original handler. Or it can
can decide not to call the original handler at all. It's a pretty uh, common pattern. Like if you, this is an admin route, you will check if, you know, the authorization has like a bearer token. If, it, if that token is a JWT, you can extract the claims from that token and validate if they have the correct permissions to even hit this uh, protected route or not. An example is a check to make sure the user is an administrator. Oh, I mean, <laughs> perfect. This is exactly what I just said. So admin only, it's returning this HTTP handler. And you can see here, there's a return and it's doing some functionality here. So if the current user is not admin, we return not found. Otherwise, we're doing kind of this then call the next handler in the function chain. The logic inside the handler can optionally decide whether to call the original handler or not. In the example above, if admin is false, the handler returning HTTP 404 not found. And, we're, and notice that the H handler is not called. If true, the user is allowed to access the root, the route, and so execution is passed to the H handler over here. Usually I have middleware listed inside the route that go file. So you can see here at route. So these are just some routes and you can see that there's the middleware. You have this admin only middleware, which is accepting this handle admin index function. And then you kind of go through, um, you know, some, some logic here. And this is a pretty common pattern. It's nothing like, you, you know, you will typically see this, this middleware pattern in a lot of examples or a lot of code you write, but it goes on to continue. Sometimes I return middleware. The above approach is great for simple cases, but if the middleware needs lots of dependencies, you know, a logger, database, clients, then I have been known to have a function that returns the middleware function. Problem is you end up with a code that looks like this. You can see here, you have these four routes. You have each of them taking in a middleware with all of these different uh, parameters and arguments. And then, then here is the actual handler function that get called based on those routes. So he's claiming that this bloats out the code and doesn't really provide anything useful. Instead, I would have the Miller function take the dependencies, but return of function only takes the next handler, which is really cool. You can see here, you have this middleware function takes those exact same dependencies of the Slack client, the logger, DB, and the, uh, the slice of bytes, and it's returning the next function to call in the function chain. So the return type func h HTTP handler is the function that we will call when setting up our route. So you can see here, we instantiate the middleware, passing all those arguments only once, and then we will pass in the function into our middleware function here. So you can see here, route one, two, and three, four, the handler is middleware, handle something with the handle specific dependencies. But if you're a new new to go, this is a really good resource on basically how you can structure your Go app in a much cleaner way, I must say. So definitely big shout out to Matt putting all of this into practice, rolling simple APIs, using these techniques remain my favorite way to go. There's lots of like little puns here. It suits my aims of achieving maintainability, excellence with code that's easy to read, easy to extend by copying patterns, easy for new people to work with, easy to change without worrying, and explicitly done without any magic. So our bigger project or in large organizations, especially one like Grafana Labs who often come across specific technology choices that impact these decisions. GRPC is a good example. In cases where there are established patterns of experience or other tools or abstractions that are widely used, you'll often find yourself making the pragmatic choice of going with flow, as they say, although I suspect there's still something useful in this post for you. That was a very good article. Appreciate that work. Let me know what you all think. Did you like this article? Have you seen it before? What do you think? Any new patterns here that you may be exploring and integrating into your Go code? Make sure you leave that comment and let me know. As always, I'm always interested to see what you are all cooking up in Go. If there's any video you want to see me make in the future, make sure you leave that also. If you haven't already, comment, like, and subscribe. What are you doing? Oh, and I forgot. You got a power.